hi everyone. So um, thank you for that introduction. And um, I'm thrilled to be here to talk about my research interest. Um, I'm going to talk about how to put your money where your mouth is, but also why we don't. Because honestly, I know more about why we don't than I do about how to get us to do it. But um, so just to be, um, just for that caveat. Also, I wanted to also give a caveat that I am not a paragon of wonderfulness as far as this goes. And so um, I am myself flawed, which is, I think, why I study this. And so I didn't want to give the impression that I was saying that I know all the answers and that I um, live in a recycled grass hut and <laughs> always ride my bicycle, because I don't. Um, maybe I should. All right, so if you look at the, um, so I was in the marketing department for 20 years, and now I'm in the business government and society department. So I'll talk about marketing issues. Some of you might be interested in marketing issues. But I think even if you aren't, I think you can notice that as consumers, we don't always behave so great. So um, we consume a lot of plastic bottles. I'm consuming one right now. Um, we test, we have a lot of companies that unnecessarily test on animals. and. Um, and child labor is rampant. It's rampant um, primarily in other countries besides this country, but there, it does happen in this country as well. Um, there's trafficking and forced labor that goes on. If you look at our purchasing, it doesn't necessarily reflect wonderful values. But that doesn't mean that people are just awful. I mean, one thing that you could do is just kind of hide behind this veneer of cynicism and say, well, that's because people are terrible. If I weren't being recorded, I would say something else. But people aren't great, right? So, um, because the truth is people kind of are great. People give to charity. They gave $358 billion in 2014, which is 2% of the GDP. That's not nothing, right? Um, people give people kidneys. And some people give people kidneys that they don't even know. That actually happens. Um, People have donated bone marrow. I have a really good friend whose son is alive because of this. I mean, he's unambiguously alive because of this. And it was a stranger in Germany. He didn't even know. He must be related to him in some way. But this guy decided to do this. Um, people adopt from shelters. People you see all the time, examples of people behaving well towards their neighbors, towards their family, towards strangers. So. Why is there this seeming disconnect? If we can look at some of the reasons for the disconnect, we could maybe try to do better ourselves, or at the very least understand why. From a scientific standpoint, it's kind of nice to know maybe why. I'm not going to be able to cover all the possible reasons why, because of course there are lots and lots of reasons. But I'll cover some of them that are relevant to my research. Because one of my philosophies is I feel like we're doing a lot of work over there in our building and in all the buildings on campus. And we don't always let everybody know what we're doing. And so now, late in life, I'm trying to do more of that citizen professor thing where I try to talk about what I'm finding out and, um, and just be honest about what it, what it says and what it doesn't say. So, um, so to that end, this um, wonderful reporter, Richard Conniff, who you might be familiar with from the New York Times, um, called me and wanted to talk about our purchasing behavior. And he confessed that he doesn't always reflect his values in how he shops. And I confessed as well. And it's basically an article about how we fall short and why we fall short. It doesn't give the answers. But, um, but it was one reason why it was good is I could take some of the comments and try to shape my um, talk around it. And it was also good because I could put that picture on my door, which I just did. I guess it's not a very friendly thing to put on your door. Um, so let me get some possibilities out of the way. I, what I usually do is give my talk and let people, oh, by the way, can you hear me? Because I can just hear myself perfectly well, but I have no idea. What it, OK, so you can hear me. And I often um, teach in classes like this where I don't even use a mic, so I'm guessing you can hear me. So, um, so what I usually do is give a talk like this and then let people ask me 
um, questions and I, I deal with them. But I'm realizing that there are two particular questions that tend to come up that if you're sitting there with that question, we'll never get anywhere in terms of you listening to me. So let me just sort of try to at least make an argument to swipe those problems away. So the first one, I call it the whole foods effect. The basic idea here, and you can read, this is one of the comments on the, um, the New York Times article. So here's the basic idea. Sure, we would all be ethical if we could, but it's super expensive. And then always, 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 when people say this to me, which they say it to me all the time, they always bring up whole foods. That's why I call it the whole foods effect. If you go to whole foods, it's like whole paycheck, they say. And I try to, oh, I've never heard that before. But yeah, I mean, it is expensive sometimes in whole foods. They're not actually expensive on every single thing that they sell, but sure, it could be more expensive to go to whole foods. And if someone's starving, they can't go to whole foods. That's true. If someone were starving, I don't think they should go to whole foods probably. But I would contend that that is an excuse that many of us use to not have to think about this stuff. Because it doesn't really, it's not really true when you look at it more closely. Yes, it's true that whole foods can be expensive, but the whole, the, the overall argument breaks down. Yeah, sometimes, like if you wanna buy, let's just use organic um, consumer packaged goods, CPGs for now, um, and then we'll kind of move on. But even if you look at those, yeah, it's true that the lemons, citrus I think is really hard to grow organically and so it tends to be especially expensive. So an a organic lemon is more expensive than a non-organic lemon. Um, but even for these kinds of goods, it isn't even really true anymore that you can't buy the environmental one or the sustainable one or it's way more expensive. In fact, I had a trouble finding examples where it was true. So. Um, for bananas, very little difference in price. And um, you can get, like Palm Olive has an eco brand and you can get seventh generation. Really, honestly, there isn't a huge, huge price difference. But that's not even really the point. The point is, just doing a comparison with organic produce that you might find in Whole Foods is not, of course, looking at the overall what does it mean to be an ethical consumer? So the most ethical thing you can do is just not buy as much stuff, which I'm very guilty of myself, but of course, just don't buy a lot of stuff. Don't waste a lot of stuff. Supposedly, wasting of food is one of the worst things we do. And so I'm trying to do better. It's really hard when you have a 12-year-old who changes her mind about what she wants to eat every day. But wasting food is a big deal, so just don't waste food. Um, a second way is to buy secondhand and not new. That's obviously great for the environment. It's clearly cheaper. Um, we've also been taught by marketers, which now that I'm not in the marketing department, I can make fun of them maybe a little bit more, that more complicated is better, but the truth is baking soda, vinegar, borax, all these things are really good environmentally. There's no problem with them. They're super cheap and they work just as well. So the argument that you have to get some fancy papaya that's wrapped in foil to be ethical it is just something we kind of tell ourselves, I think, sometimes to avoid the issue. The bottom line is I'm not talking about someone who's barely making ends meet, okay? Absolutely, someone who's barely making ends meet or who's super, super busy, they're doing the best they can. But um, someone who's barely making ends meet is doing better than most of us anyway, right? So this is kind of what my life looks like in terms of things and, you know, I'm doing the best I can, but that's kind of what it looks like. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying, and it always comes up whenever these issues come up in the comments section or whenever I'm giving a talk. Well, what about people who can only afford to shop at Walmart? Okay, there may be people like that, but that's not everybody, right? So we're still, all of us who can afford to are falling short maybe of our values. Okay. The second most common argument is the hopelessness argument, that nothing you do will make any difference. And it's, this argument is kind of funny because it's sort of true about all ethical arguments. I mean, you don't go kill someone because someone else might kill someone. Murder will still exist if I, if I, go kill, if I kill someone or not. 
well, yeah, but ethical activity is your own ethical activity. And it does add up. Um, people can make a difference. There's a site here, which you can't really read, about examples of boycotts working. Sometimes people do make a difference. It usually takes publicity. It takes boycotts. It takes contacting the company. It's worth at least trying, right? So it's also, I think, a dissonance reducing thing where you feel kind of uncomfortable because you're not doing what you what you value and you say it doesn't matter if I do what I value because it won't make any difference. And you can see how that falls apart as an ethical argument, right? Okay, so let's move on to me. So I'm a behavioral economist, which means that um, I actually in grad school worked with an economist and a psychologist as my advisors. And I like to look at the ways in which psychology help explain economic behavior. And we are, um, for a long time, everybody thought we were big weirdos. And I didn't even get a job when I first came out of grad school in psychology because I was looking for a psychology job. And they were like, why are you talking about economic behavior? Nobody is interested in that. And certainly the economists weren't interested. But now we're kind of fancy because we've gotten two Nobel Prizes. Danny Kahneman got one for this book, Thinking Fast and Slow, which is a master work, if you are interested in reading a master work. And Dick Thaler just got one last week. I think it was last week for Nudge, which is also a really good book. This one's a master work, though. <laughs> but this is also a really good book. Um, and so that's kind of where I'm coming from, trying to look at the psychology of economic behavior. So um, I'm going to talk about three behavioral reasons people don't reflect their ethics in their purchasing. We'll have to just sort of see how the time goes. I think I talk fast, so I think I'm going. I'm going to be OK. But if you don't understand what I'm saying, or I'm going too fast, or you can't understand the slide or something, feel free to raise your hand. Is that allowed? Well, I don't know. I'm in charge right now. So <laughs> raise your hand, or you know, at, let me know if something doesn't make sense, or if I stumbled over my words in a certain way. Um, I do. I know I talk fast. So we're going to talk about willful, oh, we're going to talk about willful ignorance, faulty interpretation of attributes, and the wrong context. And these are all things I've done research in and I think are powerful in terms of um, ethical consumerism. So the problem is, and the reason why rational kind of approaches, like economic approaches, get this wrong, is they expect people to have integrated preferences. But truthfully, the devil and the angel, which are sitting on people's shoulders in lots of cartoons, for reason, right? There's a reason why it's so prevalent, because it's true that the devil and the angel, metaphorically, are not well integrated. The parts of our brains that like to plan and have ethics are not the same parts of our brains that have visceral drives and wants and that sort of thing. And to expect them to be integrated, it doesn't make any sense for how we know how the brain works. And so, um, so we're constantly fighting these fights with our brain. And it's not surprising that sometimes we go one way and sometimes we go the other. It isn't that we're just not ethical. We are. Sometimes we are, right? And then sometimes we're not. So the first one I want to talk about that I think is really um, prevalent is willful ignorance. So I want to have a class participation while I drink some water. So raise your hand. If you know whether the shampoo that you used last night or this morning, if that company tests on animals. So if you know whether they do. OK, wow. Um, show offs. All right. So <laughs> raise your hand whether you, if you don't know. Oh, and just, I don't know if this is necessary, but it also is a funny story, so i got to tell you this funny story. So one time I was droning on about animal testing of shampoo to my undergraduate ethics class, and they were staring at me like I was completely nuts. And finally I said, what? <laughs> and they said, we just don't see what the big deal is. Because I was talking about rabbits and testing on rabbits, and she's like, this woman was like, who cares if they're shampooing rabbits? It doesn't hurt them. <laughs> OK, so the animal testing is it's more invasive than that. They'll put it in the rabbit's eyes or something. OK, so all right. So if you raise your hand that you don't know, now raise your hand if you actually do care about it. There you go. So there we go. And if I said to you, no, you don't care, what would be your reaction? Shut up, you mean lady. <laughs> you do. 
that caring that you have and the whatever it is that made you use a shampoo that you don't even know both exist. They're both, you know, I would I don't know if there are there are some economists here, but maybe they'll I don't know. You have both utilities. I mean, you have both of them. They're both real. It's just that for some reason you never went and found out if that company tests on animals. And you could say there's no way to find out. That's not true. There's no way to find out. You probably last night tried to find out what a rutabaga looks like on Google or whatever. I mean, we all find out all kinds of stuff. Is Bob Barker still alive? I mean, we're all finding out stuff all the time. You could have found out if your shampoo, if that company tests on animals. Now, maybe there's some people who are incapable of it, but you got yourself here. You can do it. You can get around the construction, around the AT&T Center, you can do it. So, um, so the marketplace doesn't always provide information about all this ethical stuff. But a lot of times, it doesn't really hurt the companies if they don't provide it, because people won't go find it out. So there's a lot of willful non-disclosure. So L'Oreal goes in and out of animal testing. Right now, they are again, I think, because um, China wants them to for some reason. There was some deal that happened where they weren't, and then for a while they were, and now they are again, and maybe they, maybe they aren't again, I don't know. But um, you think about what food you're served in a place like McDonald's, you don't really know where the food comes from, or really any restaurant. Um, they're not gonna tell you fries made with you know, GMO oil or whatever children were harmed in the making of this product, right? I mean, they're not gonna tell you that. You have to go find it out. And there's a big difference if you think about weighting all the attributes to come up with what you wanna do. There's a big difference between if they tell you versus they don't. You can tell the color of the car, but it's harder to tell, did they use recycled steel, what's in the tires, and so on. So um, another issue is that suppose you wanna go find out so it's very different to go find out if your shampoo company tests on animals versus if Bob Barker's still alive or what a rutabaga looks like. Because you kind of know at some level that PETA, the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, probably gives you that information, which PS they do. They have a list of who treat, how, people, how companies treat animals and so on. But if you go to try to find out this information, this is the kind of thing that you see. So PETA wants people to be vegan. Most people aren't vegan, so automatically you are like, well, I'm not vegan, that makes me feel bad, right? Plus a lot of the, the stuff they do is, is shock because they want you to be shocked, they want you to see, and they're outraged. But the problem is going to find the information is extremely unpleasant. So this is a woman who's, you know, they're treating her like you might treat food that you were going to eat. And so there are all kinds of costs to obtaining this kind of ethical information. And my research shows that people just don't want to think about it because they have to get on with their day, right? There's a lot of emotion involved. Mm -hmm. But on the shampoo bottle, it says you can see there's a label right there, cruelty free. Or the, some, some of them put cruelty free, but the ones who are cruel don't put cruel. And there, there are ones that may not test on animals. Like when L'Oreal stopped testing on animals, they didn't suddenly say cruelty free. So it's not full information, right? So you have to go look it up because of willful non-disclosure, right? So if you want to find out about, so, um, so one difficulty with a lecture like this is I don't know what your personal ethics are. So, um, and of course I'm saying, let's express our own personal ethics, right? And our, Shopping. So for some people, it might be something environmental. For other people, it might be child labor. So I'm going to mostly use environmental stuff and child labor and organic. But you could have other ones, right? We can all kind of vote with our wallets however we want to, just like we vote when we vote, which we also should vote. Well, that would be good. Somebody said that in one of the comments. It's like, why don't we just actually vote? That would be good. Um, I would endorse that. That would be good. Um, but you think about trying to find out about something like protests of... Um, farmers in um, Ethiopia. So you see information like this. It's really hard to look at. And I would say it's getting even harder because the world is kind of really a mess right now. And there's just so much bad stuff. And there's you know, 
all different parts of the country are dealing with um, genocide and flooding and earthquakes and right. Um, but this is an example of the kind of thing you might read. Um, Ethiopian security forces are violently suppressing the largely peaceful protests and so on. And you know, it's hard to look at it. And you think about it, it's also offset by the fun of all the other kinds of attributes, right? So you're thinking about getting a new sweater and it has a certain fit and a certain color and a certain feel to it. That's a lot more fun to think about than who picked the cotton that went into it. Um, so it turns out there are issues with cotton, which, gosh, you think even cotton? <laughs> but um, so there is some forced labor going on with cotton. I just peeled this off um, the Human Rights Watch, which is a good place to go, um, yesterday. So 13 and 14 year old children are forced to pick cotton after school. Why would that be? Huh? They just need someone to do it. But the company must be giving them money. The company must be giving them money to do it. Um, so they ordered them to pick cotton after school, I guess. The, certainly the company probably did something to make the schools want to do that. They gave them money. You'd have to read it. It was so depressing, I stopped reading it. How's that? <laughs> it's depressing. All right, so I've given you a bunch of anecdotes, and sometimes that can be enough to know something's true. But in my line of work, we're supposed to go then take something into the lab and really see if it's true. So I want to talk about one of my papers on willful ignorance. Um, and what, we want, what I wanted to know is, do people do this? Because how this kind of came about was I went to go in my previous house where I, I um, lived, I wanted to make a garden. And I went to one of those quarries that has, they have tons of um, rocks that you can buy. It's really kind of cool because you buy the rocks and then you put the rocks in your car and they weigh your car before and after and then they know how much it is and the whole thing is extremely enjoyable. And, um, and they have these river rocks that are really smooth and pretty. And I was seeing them, and I remember seeing them thinking, those are beautiful. Also, where did those come from? And so I remember this moment years ago where I was thinking, I'm not going to ask him where they came from, and then I can buy them. And then I thought, oh, I study this for a living. I should make myself ask him. So I asked him, where did the rivers come from? And he said, a river rocks come from. And he said, a river? <laughs> and I said, <laughs> was it a live river, like a flowing river that you scoop those out? And he's like, are you an environmentalist? And then he walked away. <laughs> so in the strength of his response and kind of being in the moment, I didn't buy them. But it made me think, I bet other people do this too. And if I find out, which I kind of found out from his reaction, then I will actually use the information that they're from somewhere he doesn't want to tell me, right? And so. I thought, huh, well, people not ask, but then use the information. And it's really hard to come up with a rational way of thinking about humans that allows that, right? So these violations of rationality intrigue me. So I think people will actually use the information um, if they're given it. So that was what this was about. And since there's been a ton of papers um, following this up and thinking about this, and it seems to be true across a lot of domains. So, so what I did, just because I think it's important, since I'm a professor, to tell you the kind of ways that we get knowledge, right? Um, so what we did is we had 182 people, and we told them they're shopping for a wooden desk and chair set. They weren't actually shopping for it. We did one. We've done studies where they're actually doing something, but in this case, they weren't actually doing it. But we told them it had these attributes, workmanship, comfort, type of wood, and price. So let me use this. Workmanship, comfort, type of wood, and price. And then we explained what the woods were, and we explained how rainforest wood meant it was endangered and you know, causes environmental problems. Um, and so we had them um, have to request the information. So 
we gave them just a blank matrix of deaths. And we said, if you raise your hand, we'll come along with these envelopes. My poor RA, my poor research assistants had to make these envelopes with the attribute information. And you can then fill it in, and then you'll know, you know. So what do you suppose they asked for first? Price. And that makes sense, because you've got to know whether you can afford it, even when you're kind of pretending, right? So, and then they, they asked for them. And we said, you know, we're, gonna, we're kind of in a hurry, and this is very clumsy. And we on purpose made it clumsy. But um, so you probably won't have a chance to ask for everything. So we actually, in different experiments, cut them off after two or three. Um, or we let them do all of them, but we paid attention to the order. Because if they know they're going to be cut, if they don't going to be cut off, you should just ask for all of them in whatever order. But if you might be cut off, even after the first one or the second one, you should ask for them in the order that you care about them. So then we had them actually tell us their likelihood of purchasing the desks. And we used something called conjoint measurement, where we can kind of see um, what their weights of these attributes are, like how much they care about the attributes. And all we're looking at is, do they use things in the same order that they request them? That's logical, right? You should use things in the same order that you request them. Um, no. <laughs> so if you look at the rainforest attribute, which is the ethical attribute, people actually use it if they find it out. You give it to them. But they don't ask for it. And you could say, well, that's because they're not paying any attention to what you're even asking them, and they don't care, because this is a weird task for them to be doing. Fair enough. So the way we see if that kind of thing is true is we ask them things about themselves. So how much does it matter to you? How much does the rainforest matter to you? How much do environmental issues matter to you? So we find out. So for the people for whom it matters the most, there should be more consistency, right, Kishore? Yes. He's, our, he's an economist. He would know. There should be more consistency if it matters to you more, right? I mean, that would be the, the thing you would say, that if it doesn't matter to you, you wouldn't ask. But there should be more consistency. But actually, our effect really is right there with those important people. They use it more than they request it. People, for the most part, request it about the same amount, which is to say they don't. And I'm um, not surprised that if they don't care, they don't request it. They actually request it a little bit more than they even use it if they don't care, I guess because, I don't know, there's randomness in human behavior. But what's really interesting is that people who really care use it more than they request it. So that's your willful ignorance right there. So people are staying willfully ignorant of ethical information. Why? Well, it turns out that people actually feel less sad and less angry if they avoid the information. And this is for something not that deep, right? It's a hypothetical thing, rainforest, right? Imagine you could really multiply this by a lot in your real life, thinking about child labor, or thinking about something that's really dramatic, right? So, um, so more predicted sadness, more anger, the more you um, avoid, um, look at the information versus avoid it. So willful ignorance is rampant. And I think that's why this paper has gotten a lot of attention, because I think we all know that we do it. Um, we don't really know how our clothes are made. I'm trying to pay more attention to it. I tried when I got dressed today for my talk, in case somebody was going to give me a hard time to kind of dress in you know, brands I know are doing a good job. But it's really hard. Shoes are especially hard. I wrote, this is, these are by Bourne, and I wrote them and asked them. But they're not going to answer me. I don't think, because I don't think they know what to say. Yeah. Um, well, how would that work in this? So this is, do you care about the rainforest? Or? Yeah, so we asked them questions about, um, about workmanship, you know, because we had other attributes, so how much do you care about that? And those went in the right direction. So that kind of is really important for the paper. So if you care more about it, you ask more about it. 
The only thing that ever works the other way, in all of the studies I've done on this, the only thing that works the other way is ethical stuff, where you ask for it less the more you care about it. And so you kind of need that, because if it were true that people always ask for it less the more they care about it, no matter what the attribute is, then that would just mean people are big goofballs. I don't know what they're doing, right? But if it's ethical, they do it more. And that's true, right? If you care more about if it's a sports car, then you go find out if it's a sports car. But if you care if it you know, might be harming the environment, maybe you're like, I'm tired. <laughs> I'll look later. Yeah. OK, so um, if you think about it, I would argue that this willful ignorance may do more than a lot of other the, of the elements that we think are so important. Because if nobody's finding out, it's really, really hard for anything much to get done. Um, and I would argue that this ethical information is really likely to be missing or difficult to find. So given it's really likely to be missing or difficult to find, I mean, God bless Whole Foods, actually, because they started ma making this their, their centerpiece. So at least we know to kind of ask for it sometimes or to look for it. But for the most part, it's really hard to find it. It's getting better. But I think people think because no one's, many people are not going and really, really trying to find it, that no one cares. And that's just not true. If you give them the information, I think they do care. Um, so what, it mean, what does it mean? It means that if people know, they'll use it. So if you're doing the right thing, you should tell people. If you're doing the wrong thing, shame on you, stop doing the wrong thing. But it is true, if you're doing the wrong thing, probably people won't try to find out. But do the right thing and tell people. Um, so in terms of government, don't expect people to find out who's doing it. Um, labeling, a lot of top environmentalists, like the guy who founded um, Stonyfield Farms, um, Gary Hirschberg, he, Hirschfeld, Gary Hirschfeld, he's doing this work on um, labeling and trying to push for labeling because his idea is that if we could just get labeling, people would pay attention to it. And I think that's actually true, that um, you don't have to force people to behave a certain way, but if you tell them the information, they will abide by it. And I actually, to bring up Whole Foods again, I think Whole Foods is an example of that. Um, so, I think one of the big solutions is just to have laws, like laws about labeling and also laws that keep us from doing the most egregious, horrible thing. Because the truth is, you know, come on, to expect people to figure out the most egregious, horrible thing and that's how we're going to stop it, just stop it with a law. But the current political climate doesn't like me saying that, but it's true. Or some sort of nudge to try to get people um, to know the information can be really useful too. Um, I actually have a paper that's forthcoming in the Journal of Consumer Research that shows that people actually will forget bad ethical information later. So, because willful ignorance, and it's people who care the more who would do with that also. So you have to really give them the information. It has to be right there at purchase time. So if I tell you now, did you know that L'Oreal is doing animal testing again? You are unlikely to remember that later. You'll remember it if I say they're not doing animal testing. It isn't just people forget, they forget the bad stuff. So, um, so hmm? Oh, can you give me the context right before that? Well, I was saying I think really egregious things need to have laws. Maybe that's what. Just forget it. I mean, it's ridiculous to expect consumers to be able to hold all this information in their head to try to make it so that children aren't enslaved or whatever. Just have laws against that. But, but you can find the egregious things. Um, for example, I think that depends on the person. I think most people wouldn't say that was egregious to the extent that child slavery is, yeah. I mean, society would have to decide it. But right now, we're just in this mood now where we just don't think we should legislate anything, and so that's kind of a, a problem. But the most egregious things, that's what I would recommend if I were in charge, which there's some reason I'm not in charge, and I should be. It's clear. 
But if I were in charge, I would say that there should be laws against the most egregious stuff. But given there's not right now, there are not laws. I mean, chocolate is, it turns out, very bad. And if you buy Nestle or something, they're not so great to their workers. And there's lots of stuff going on you wouldn't want to know about. We're not going to stop importing that kind of chocolate. So given I think we should, but we're not, we can maybe buy a different kind of chocolate. OK, so that's what I'm going to say, because this lecture is supposed to be lecture. This chat is supposed to be telling you what we can do. And one thing we can do is try to make yourself find out. And I know this is hard. I study this for a living. And I know people might ask me with these gotcha questions, well, what are you wearing? And I even, even then, I have trouble making myself sometimes go find out. So I get that it's hard. But if all of us just did it 5% more, 10% more, I think it could make a difference. And one way that you can do it, and somebody had a comment like this on that New York Times article. That was a really good comment. Instead of figuring out who the bad companies are, try to figure out some of the good ones and support them. Because a lot of them are small, and they're likely to go out of business. And so and we know that. So maybe we can start supporting them and gradually, like I like this company Everlane. And so I'm on purpose wearing their clothes today. Um, and I think that they're small enough, they might be in danger of going out of business. And so just buy a few things from them. Maybe go to the Gap sometimes, although I have to say, I've eliminated the gap. But it, you know, it takes time to eliminate the gap from your life. Um, OK, so another thing that happens is that people associate ethical attributes with all kinds of negative stuff. And we don't really know, because there hasn't been that much research on this. There's been a little bit. This is a hugely cited paper, but it's often cited in the wrong way, unfortunately. But some people are trying to explore this. What, you know, what are your, if I told you that a shirt was made with um, you know, organic fibers, would you think it was soft? Or would you think it wasn't soft? Or would you think it wasn't fashionable? If I said that you know, some clothing was made in a super ethical way, would you think that meant it was more earthy, crunchy than sophisticated? You know, we have all these sort of um, ideas in our head of what it means to be ethical that um, you know, researchers don't really know what those are yet. But marketers, if anybody here is a marketer, can go to try to find out. And, and you, as a consumer, can try to figure out, what are, you, what are your thoughts in that way? And you know, how can we address it? So this um, paper is, I think, my most cited paper, or one of my most cited papers, because it just grabs everybody. Um, and it has these cute um, field studies. So one of them is um, my co-author set up the, um, in the lobby of our building this hand sanitizer station. And he has a sign that he still has in his office that says, the CDC recommends us using hand sanitizer to avoid the bird flu or whatever kind of scary flu. I don't know. He made that up. It's probably true that they think you should. Um, and so he just sat there. And sometimes he had a confederate. A confederate is someone who seems like they're just milling around, but they're with the experiment. But sitting right there at the table, staring at people and what they were doing. So when he was there, when the Confederate was there, staring at people and what they were doing, sure enough, they, they chose the, the sustainable hand sanitizer. It was, you know, he had sustainable written on it or something. When the Confederate was not there and was, frankly, behind the poll looking, people chose the less sustainable hand sanitizer. And then we did more focused psychological studies that show that people associate sustainable with weak and not sustainable with strong. And so for a hand sanitizer, they actually were the same hand sanitizer in real life. For a hand sanitizer, they want something strong, and so they don't pick the sanitizer. Now, something like this is just a field study. We have no idea kind of what's actually happening. So we did a bunch of other studies. When you publish, you have to have, in my field, at least four or five studies. So this was another cute field study where um, we got these t-shirts that were just um, Hanes t-shirts. And we're wa we washed them in a detergent that was a different detergent from the one that we talked about. So in my field, you're allowed to lie to people. In some fields, you can't. So, so we. Um, 
told them that we had washed them in Purex and seventh generation, which cost around the same and all of this. So we actually hadn't. We'd washed them in a different one that was separate had, you know, in the very same one. So the t-shirts are exactly the same. So this is a classic kind of psychological experiment um, that you can do where you're getting people to project what their thoughts are onto a stimulus that doesn't have any meaning. It's like Rorschach ink blots from the old movies, right? But with t-shirts. So we asked them to just feel them and smell them and look at them and tell us a bunch of stuff about these t-shirts. So what they said was, they know that seventh generation is an ethical product. So we need that. We need to, because we we're trying to get them to project, they've got to be projecting something. And they know it's a eth more ethical company. Um, but it was below the midpoint um, towards Purex and all the stuff that matters for actually having a clean t-shirt. So they thought it felt better, it looked cleaner, it smelled better, it was a more effective detergent, and they preferred the detergent if it was Purex. See? So here's the midpoint. Certainly they know the seventh generation is more ethical. We want them to know that. Um, but they didn't think it was as good a detergent. And we know from all of our psychological work with, that people think that sustainable means less strong. So it makes sense that they wouldn't think it was as good a detergent. Now, did everyone get that? There's no actual information in the t-shirts. So they felt them, they smelled them, they looked at them. So um, the press loves stuff like this. Of course, the press, a lot of people wrote that this study shows people hate environmental products. That's not actually true. In most of our studies, we found that people wanted the environmental product. They just didn't think it was as good. In this one, they did prefer Purex. Um, so we call this the sustainability liability. When something is sustainable, people think it's less strong. They think it's more gentle. And you can do these really cool um, subconscious sort of tests where you can see what people's associations are. And sure enough, they associate being not sustainable with being strong. Um, so we actually tried it with baby shampoo, where the people want to be soft, and they like the sustainable baby shampoo, which I think could explain why there have been certain companies that um, give, uh, make stuff for children that have done really well with sustainability. So we tried this with lots of products. We used tires. Turns out recycled rubber, it's just rubber. Rubber is rubber, it doesn't matter. Because people don't want tires made out of recycled rubber. Um, we did, I wanted to do climbing ropes. I don't remember we ever did it, but people don't want a sustainable climbing rope. But, <laughs> but for something gentle, like for children or pets or something, they want the sustainable one. Okay, so what do you do about this? Um, we ran a study where we just told people, using some data, that seventh generation is as good a detergent as Purex because it is actually, and we used actual stuff from consumers' reports because we didn't want them to have other information that violated what we were saying. And then it actually took it away. All you have to do is know it's there and address it. The problem is knowing it's there, right? So um, just one sentence, we just told them. It's just as strong. And we tried it with the tires, we explained to them that they're rated as just as strong, and we had to figure out what, how tires are rated, and we gave them real information. So think about what consumers might be worried about. They might think grass-fed beef, which is much better for the environment, is less delicious. It's actually, I think, more delicious. I'm not eating beef right now, but back when I did, I thought it was probably better. Um, do they think organic perfumes don't last as long, right? Or they smell hippy-dippy or something? Do they assume that sustainable always means more expensive? That's something that if, you're, if we have marketers, they could actually try to address by just finding out, do people have these associations? Now, and for you, you just, we can just question our assumptions. I mean, I have tended to think that sustainable clothing would be more of the kind of, I wear it on my day off and it looks like I got it in Guatemala. I would like it, but it looks kind of like I'm wearing a blanket. That's kind of what I think. So I 
am trying to question those assumptions. So I have this brand I like called Everlane, and I'm trying to, they are making a jacket now, and you know, try to question those assumptions. Why did I think that? It wouldn't have to be true, right? Okay, so any questions about this study before I move on? Yeah. Yes, for this, for this, it wouldn't necessarily be true for everything that you did, but it was so heartening that just addressing it made a huge difference. Yeah. You just have to know what it is to be able to address it in yourself as well as, you know, in your consumers or in your friends or whatever. But yeah, for this, it doesn't mean that would always be true. And they weren't actually buying the tires, so maybe for actually buying the tires, you'd have to do more. But I don't know. If you had strength ratings, I think it probably would work. Yeah. OK, so am I, when am I supposed to stop so we can have, um, nobody's here who knows the answer to that question. OK. Um, so another area I like to work in that I think is interesting and it's very behavioral econ -y, is just context. And so how you ask the question, how you ask people for their values, has a huge effect on whether they um, think about ethics or not. So when people are selling stuff, they tend to think about ethics, if you're giving something up. So suppose I said, um, hmm, let's think of an ethical thing. Well, let's think of safety, like fire safety. Suppose I said, oh, you can buy a really, really good smoke alarm from me. How much would you pay for this really good smoke alarm that I can sell you? Just answer, humor me. Like $25 or something. What? 25. 20, yeah, I said 25 too. Hey. So $25, let's say. Now suppose I say to you, I'm going to come to your house and I'm going to take away one of your smoke alarms. What is the least I could give you to take away one of your smoke alarms? It's more, right, than 25. It's a fair amount, I would say. Or suppose I said, how much would you pay to have a shirt that was made with organic cotton versus um, conventional cotton? Eh, you know, I might pay five, seven dollars more. But then I said, okay, you have this, shirt you're going to buy that's made with organic cotton. How much can I give you to switch to the conventional cotton? Don't you feel just a smidge different about that? Humor me. Say yes. I feel so overwhelmingly different. But it turns out that actually people do. And so I have a lot of papers that kind of touch on some aspect of this. A lot. That was an exaggeration. But I have two or three papers that touch on some, which is maybe a lot, but a lot of studies within each paper that touch on some aspect of this, that show that when people are selling or giving something up, they think more about ethics than when they're buying. Um, same with pricing. People tend to consider ethicality less if I ask you how much you'll pay for something. Um, a qualitative rating, like how much do you like this, people tend to think about ethicality. Um, when they're thinking about what to consider versus not consider, they think about ethicality. Um, I mean, they think less about ethicality than when they're considering what not to consider. So suppose I said to you, you're thinking about all the cars that you might buy. List, you gotta narrow them down so you can go test drive them and stuff. So list some of the ones in the, all the market that you might wanna look at more. That's called a consideration set. And you could list some. As opposed to, I said, list the ones you're not gonna look at further. In which case would you be more likely to eliminate hybrids? So in the first case, I just said what you're going to look at. You'd make a list of horrors. But in the second one, I would contend, and re my research has shown, you would be very unlikely to say you're not going to look at any hybrids. So there you go. Okay. Now let's look at purchasing. Purchasing is all the wrong ones which could help explain why. This is my book, if I ever have a chance to write a book. Well, I don't know, I have several ideas. But this could be one of my books, or a chapter in one of my books, about what the problem is. The problem is that purchasing is thinking about buying something and getting something. It's just not the right mode. 
So what does it mean? Reword the question. Not how much more would you pay to not have child labor, but how much will you accept to let there be child labor, yeah? Yes. Isn't that good? Yeah, how much will you accept to let there be child labor, you? You child labor person, right? So, so true story, I went to look to find examples where the sustainable one, which is, these are so delicious, you guys, is actually more expensive than the non-sustainable one, and it's not even true. So I had to make up these numbers. It's actually a myth, but anyway. Um, would you pay 496 for this one versus 486 for this one? Actually, in real life, this one's five something. Anyway, um, but think about it in terms of a choice. Would you choose to give 10 cents for this tiger, or would you choose 10 cents or the well-being of this tiger? He's cute, and you're going to choose 10 cents over that? We just don't think that way when we purchase, right? But we, we can. There's no reason why we shouldn't. Um, all right, so that's what that means. Um, so always people ask me, I would buy ethical, but I don't know where to go. Just quickly, there are places you can go. I can give you this, this, um, these lists. Um, made in USA or made in Europe is better than imported. Usually almost means somewhere you don't want to know what's going on. Um, fair trades tends to be a good bet, as does organic. People will say those words don't mean anything. That's actually not true. If it's fair trade certified or organic certified, it's actually hard to get those certifications. And so it does mean something. Um, some other ones, in case you want more ideas. Um, it's easiest to pick a cause and just research by that one cause. You're right. It gets overwhelming. If you try to do everything, I get that. But don't give up. When in doubt, fair trade, made in USA, cruelty-free, recycled, organic. All right, punchline. We can do better. We just have to know what our psychology, how our psychology is working against us. That's all. Um, if we just increase our awareness, if we communicate more, if we align a little bit, I think it could make a huge difference. Yeah. So we made an argument earlier that if we increase our awareness, we feel bad. So why would we want to increase our awareness? I mean, you're, you're saying, I mean, I, I get in an aggregate sense, but so why does anybody want to increase their awareness? Well, I think, um, I'm guessing, and I have not studied this, but I'm guessing there's the part where you go to look. It feels bad to think about it. But then you buy the good thing and you feel better. That's actually a good research idea. Because you feel bad looking. But I think you feel great when you buy the good one, at least I do. So it takes, I think it balances out to you feeling better. Once, once you know, it's, it's fine. So, so the argument is that once you know, then you're going to feel better in aggregate than if you don't know. But that yeah. having partial information makes us feel bad. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Yes. Julie, I wanted to ask you about something that I've been thinking about, which is give me an issue of boycotting a company. Is there a threshold where you draw the line, where we should draw the line, as opposed to one where, well, you know, they're not the greatest people in the world, but I'll buy their product? There is no. I don't know. I mean, I think that um, that sort of speaks to what is your value and is it enough? And that I can't speak to because I'm not, I can't be the guru of that. All I want is for us to pay some attention. I think if we all email the companies and ask them, that would make a huge difference. I don't think they think anyone's even looking. Um, but I, I understand because that article in the New York Times was about, he started out with Amazon, that he despises Amazon, but he still uses them. I don't despise Amazon for whatever reason as much. I mean, maybe I should, I get it, but for me, it, it's not hitting me as much as some other companies. And so, you know, so it is individual. Yeah. How about purchasing in the sense of voting for political candidates? How do these considerations enter, enter those decisions? You know, I honestly don't know because I study purchasing. I think that people's voting tends to be more driven by their ethical beliefs. But a bunch of people don't vote, so I, I don't know. But I just joined the Business, Government, and Society Department. Well, they will know answers to these. It's like, maybe Brian knows. There, there's actually an app where you can see 
<laughs> There's an app that exists, I forget what it's called, where you can scan products from your phone and figure out campaign contributions at least so that the company's packs made. And what people, is it called? I don't know. I can't, I can't tell you. I haven't okay. used it. I don't use it. Well, for it, willful ignorance. So. Yeah. <laughs> I think I actually have it. I just downloaded it, but I don't, haven't used it yet. Yeah. Uh huh. Did you guys hear that? No. The microphone. Here, maybe. I said you touched briefly in the beginning on the secondhand market, which I almost exclusively use, whether it's Goodwill or Salvation Army or eBay. Um, and I'm wondering why the, that isn't more highlighted in your talk and in general, like if you know behaviorally why that might, might be, because they carry every single brand you can imagine, style, colors, you know, shape, sizes, whatever. Um, yeah, I don't, I mean, I think there are people who research that, but I don't know. I have one paper that just came out on how, um, how to get people to give more to those, to Goodwill or whatever. If you take a picture of your good, it's easier to get rid of it. Anyway, that's what the, and they got a lot of interest, that paper, and I think people are interested in this. It's just, I don't know, um, it could be because marketing researchers want to look at marketing of, honestly, I don't know. I think it's a great, it's a great um, point because more stuff is given than we know what to even do with. And some African countries who have been receiving some of the surplus have been, um, starting to reject them because they want to have their own um, industries and they don't want to just be taking our stuff. We've got so much stuff. And, um, and people are pretty good about giving to it, although they, maybe they could do more. But shopping there is, I don't know. It's a good question. It's something I've thought about a lot. Um, like, do you get more credit? I want to do this paper, this study. Do you get more credit for going to Whole Foods and spending a bunch of money at Whole Foods than for going to Goodwill and buying a bunch of stuff and paying less money, even though, of course, going to Goodwill has so many great aspects to it. It's a really good point, and I don't know. I mean, because it's not glamorous, and so it doesn't attract yeah, researchers either. I think the image either. is not as hipster cool as Whole Foods. That's right. Although some, some of it is hipster cool, but yeah. 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 Um, hi, uh, Julie. I found many of the things that you said very interesting. Um, I agree with that thing on the second hand and particularly agree with the thing about consuming less on everything right. and I'm always shocked how people, for example, take eight napkins when I think you probably only need one or two and things of that nature. But the thing that I've been um, still not able to grasp is your concept of willingful uh, ignorance because that assumes that people know, you know, to be willful ignorance, to, to be willing to have an ignorance, you need to know. And um, I just don't think that as a society we have done the job of educating people about purchasing. I think that we go through life just simply purchasing all sorts of products, eggs, you know, milk, newspapers, shoes. So I don't think people even think about it, right? So some issues have come up yeah, you know, about because of our focus on sustainability and climate change and all of those things. But I would doubt that most people even think about it. So I'm not sure that it helps us a lot to say that we have a, you know, a will to not know. And, and that brings, I don't know where that takes us, right? Because there's thousands of products we consume every day and I'm not sure that we will ever get to understand them all. But I think that what uh, do take us some more is on your solutions. You were talking about uh, government, for example, forcing, forcing the companies to publish information. We have that for food. We, they publish the nutrition facts and many people have the option to choose what it is and say, I buy it or not. And some people use it, some don't. So publishing how you practice or test your product might not be the solution necessarily. But I think that going around and educating people on you know, the potential harms of products might be a better 
path to go about. Maybe, and, but I think even if they get educated, they're going to still practice willful ignorance unless the information's available. I do. I actually disagree. I think people are willfully ignorant. I think everybody knows there's such a thing as child labor and sweatshops. Well, not everybody, but many people. And if all the people who know about it and who care about it purchased according to it, that would be enough. It doesn't have to be every single person, but I think people do know that organic is probably better than not organic, that sustainable is better than not sustainable. And so people are blindly behaving and ignoring it, I think, because they're ignoring it. Yeah. There's thousands of products. I don't think you can think of that for every single thing you buy in here. Yeah, you can't. I mean, it, I, and I think it's difficult for every single thing. But again, I think that's dissonance reducing for us to say, well, I can't think of everything, so I'm not going to. I mean, yeah, but there has to be, for all of us, something we care about that we're not paying attention to. Yeah, Kara. So I have a question. Um, regarding willful ignorance, there's also a concept called ethical fading. Are you familiar with this? Where um, we focus on other aspects of a decision, and so the ethical aspect of the decision fades from view. And I'm curious to know, is this the same thing, willful ignorance is ethical fading? Because I can see them both as a way to eliminate cognitive dissonance um, in, in making choices. And I'm curious to know if there is a difference, what the flavor is. Yeah, the is. difference, willful ignorance is that you don't, don't find out the information, so you just never know it, because you didn't find it out. So it's different from kind of um, only thinking about other things as opposed to ethics. Yeah, let's look here. Or new, new person. Yeah, yeah. so um, I'm not sure this is going to be coherent, but um, there's a gap between my spending and, and my, my benefit. So I put solar on my home. And um, there's a whole lot more uh, emotional satisfaction that comes from that, as well as like when I wear Patagonia or I wear a shirt that I bought at Goodwill, there's an emotional, um, I'll say righteousness that comes with that, and yet my money doesn't reflect that. And I know that's the whole underlining of your, your discussion, but is there some way of, of understanding or quantifying that gap beyond just monetary, more in the emotional sense or satisfaction? Yeah, it's kind of like the same answer to Brian's question, you know, because there's the stress of finding out, but then there's this pleasure when you, you know, it, it feels great when you actually do it. And I don't know what research there is on that. My, my experience is if I start purchasing from a company that's doing things the way I want to, then I continue to do it because I get that kind of thrill. It'd be fun to trace that in consumers. But there are very few people even looking at any of this because I guess ethics is hard to think about. It's not sexy. I don't know. But, um, but I agree with you that if we could, and it's, it's interesting to think about that kind of glow, that warm glow that from altruism that's, you know, people have known about this for years. That term comes from the 50s, I think. Um, but it's really hard to anticipate that feeling. And then it's really, really strong when you have it, but then maybe you don't remember the next time to kind of know to chase after it. Yeah, I was really surprised with the solar that I knew I was doing a good thing, but there's just, it's, every month I see a reminder and it's like, it, I was surprised at how powerful that was. Yeah, it is powerful, and that's such a good point. Like how we, what we think about in the future, you know, that will make us feel better or not, is not always. We don't always predict very well, and so I think that would be a fun research idea as well to think about. Do people underestimate that warm glow? Do they underestimate that feeling of, you know, like if you buy a Prius instead of a Porsche, or well, they're not, you know, some sports car that <laughs> was around the same price but that's faster. You may, when you drive it, you just anticipate like the fun you're gonna have driving this fast sports car, and you don't think about how you're gonna feel every time you see the hybrid thing going on, and you underestimate that. And I th really think that's true. I, in general, when I think something's this true, it does turn out to be true, but I will say I haven't done the research, but I think that's really true and good for all of us to remember. You're, you're not, you don't realize how great you're gonna feel when you do the right thing. Yeah, do you want to get him since we haven't heard from him? Yeah, I'll, I'll speak loudly. Uh, so if you believe that consumers have willful, willful ignorance about um, some of the ethical issues when they're purchasing, I thought a lot about that the solution for our society is actually um, lies on not just the companies, but just us as, as, as a society to try to understand how do you incentivize consumers to buy the products instead of trying to convince them of the social good 
that we have to try to understand, okay, how do you, how do you understand what are the core incentives, why do people buy, and then you reverse engineer, okay, gradually more and more people buy products that happen to be socially beneficial, but maybe they cost less, maybe they do something else, and I just, I guess, I don't know if you have any thoughts, but I'm very interested in how you can, maybe it's making a socially beneficial good less expensive, maybe it's doing something else, but. Yeah, I mean, some of that might just take government interference, obviously. Um, and so that's kind of what a nudge is. So you can nudge people towards, it's not a law that you have to buy the organic one, but you nudge towards organic in some way. Or another, maybe by subsidizing organic farming or something. Yeah, and, um, or making the, like a lot of people think the Prius looks kind of cute and interesting and so people might buy it for that reason. Um, I don't know if that will put us over the top though. I mean, but certainly that's something that people can use. I mean, there are organic companies that have organic um, products and they just put the organic thing very small because they want um, other stuff to, like I think sweet leaf tea is like that. They want the taste and all of that to overwhelm it and then they, you know, they like that they have organic so they put it on there. But um, I think it's gonna take all of those things. I think it's gonna take the whole kit and caboodle. Yeah. Uh, another example of that is wine. Many uh, winemakers now use organic grapes, but very few of them put it on the label because they think that consumers will think if it's organic grapes, they won't taste as good. It won't be sophisticated won't or something. But wh what I would like to know is, do we know anything about the difference between reputation and actuality? So I'm thinking in particular of greenwashing, which there seems to be a lot of. Yeah, I mean... Greenwashing exists. I don't, um, it's just one other thing that gets in the way of us doing the right thing. But I don't think, I think sometimes people jump from the fact that greenwashing sometimes happens to thinking, well, then it doesn't matter. I shouldn't pay attention to it. But the truth is, greenwashing is when someone lies, basically. When they say, um, I like clean coal or whatever. Coal is super environmentally good. And I'm, because I'm going to put the word clean in front of it. Yeah, but I had some women back here who had. Yeah, so what does your research say about companies that have a mixed bag of being ethical? So Walmart's a good example where um, they actually supply a lot of organic produce and organic fish, um, but, and they also work with suppliers to reduce waste. Um, but they also have that perception of being a very, uh, I guess, unethical company. There's the other side of that too, where the body shop is example where in terms of using their products, they don't use animal testing, but they actually still use a lot of the research from other um, companies that do use animal testing. Right, so it's a mixed bag, it's hard, it's not easy. It's so, like any other ethical thing, right? I mean, yeah, I mean Walmart, if you really care about sustainability, they are trying to be good about that. So you could go shop there and just buy their organic stuff. If you care about workers' rights, you may not want to shop there. I mean, I mean you know, yeah. I mean, how do, how do, I guess, consumers really make these decisions then? Or like, what? It's an individual, you have to make it individually, given your values, like which, does the fact that they are doing the sustainable stuff they're doing offset whatever worker problems they have for you? Because my issue is, most of us aren't expressing our values in what we do anyway, right? If we all started doing that, then we might get to these confusions where we're like, well, how exactly do I do it? But I guess my issue is that we're not even doing it anyway, <laughs> right? So if we got to the point where we were that sophisticated, I think we'd be pretty far along. And I agree with you. I have the same feelings about Walmart because they really have done a good job with sustainability stuff. Mm -hmm. And they want to come talk to the business school sometimes about that. And they invite me to the meetings. Well, they used to. <laughs> um, and I'm with you. I get it. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Have you come across a study showing ethics first time? So when it comes down and the person who doesn't like Amazon, but now they're down to two days before Halloween, Christmas, whatever it may be, and they push that button, have you had any type of studies to showing if ethics declines? I'm positive it does. I wouldn't have to do that study. <laughs> yeah. If you're in a hurry, I mean, in general, if people are in a hurry, they, you know, they just choose by price and then they go on. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, which is probably my issue. But we had a woman here who had a question, too. Yeah. I think you answered it. We've been talking about the Prius quite a bit. And I was looking into getting a Prius and told my dad, and he said, you know, the batteries are really bad for the environment. 
And in that case, you're better off getting a used car, a secondhand car, than something that has such a, a, a detrimental impact on uh, the sustainability. And so, you know, I, I guess I was just picking up on, on what you were just talking about there. Actually, I think you, you sort of addressed it. But you get into this quandary of you don't know what you don't know. Like you might know a little bit about one strain of this range of continuum of ethics and the various ways that it plays out or doesn't play out in the products that we buy. Um, but, but then you don't know what you don't know. So what would you say to someone who cares, um, but, but across the entire spectrum of things that we should care about, how do we ever get educated enough? Just like you do with anything else. You do the best you can. I mean, my point is we're not doing anywhere near at all anything, much less the best we can. So it's going to be complicated because ethics are complicated, right? So anything you were trying to decide to do, apart from like who to vote for, who to support in this, who to, you know, how to treat your neighbor, you would still, it would still be complicated and you'd have to figure it out. I, my point is that, you know, I don't think we are expressing our values and our purchasing very much at all. I know that I don't all the time. And so um, if you are that concerned about the environment that you're looking into a Prius, you're already way far ahead. And then look and see, is it true that Overall, a Prius is better for the environment than it is bad for the environment compared to a used car. P.S. The answer is yes, it is. And then how do you know? Because... People have done that. And the answer is... The Prius is better. The... Okay, I and mean, we can also, you can also disagree. But the thing is, this level of conversation that we're having, we hardly ever have, right? If we get to that point where we're having this level of conversation, then we're good, right? And then we'll make a different decision maybe, but at least we're being driven by our values. But what I don't want to happen is people to hear this and go, well, then it's impossible. Because it really isn't impossible. You just make whatever judgment you want to make with your values. It's just that we might disagree. So. Well, obviously, as scientists, I know people who do industrial ecology, and I've been very curious about um, energy use, uh, fuel costs, the future of electricity, and so forth. So I've looked deeply into this. And so um, I think her father is onto something. Um, but we should look at everything with an unvarnished look. We shouldn't just assume that Whole Foods is ethical. Okay, we have one more question. Uh, so in this talk you have <clears throat> used words, we have ethics, uh, lies, and truth, and marketing. You, you even presented information where you said, I'm not showing you what the real numbers are to get you to think about what I'm thinking about. So do you have to lie to us to tell the truth? Do you have? Do we have to be lied to to get what our true decision-making process is? And is that partially what behavioral economics is about? There's also context, right? You, somebody walks into a room, the sanitizers are the same. I told you they're different. I just lied to you to try to get to understand your true behavior. So you lied to get to what you're now going to tell me is my true behavior, and this is an ethical thing to do so that I can then learn how to do marketing to get you to do an ethical thing later. So lying is in the process of get to me to do the ethical, truthful thing. And so I'm just kind of wondering how behavioral economics thinks about that problem. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so what you're asking about is deception in research. So uh, there's a big difference among, um, among disciplines. So economists, and many behavioral economists were trained in, a, in an economics, get, got economics PhDs. Um, and I worked with an economist, and when we did work with him, um, no deception. That's what economists say. Psychologists, and I would say more behavioral economists are psychologists, although Dick Thaler, economist, Danny Kahneman, psychologist. Psychologists, um, and as far as I know, Danny Kahneman didn't, hasn't engaged in much deception in his research either because he was publishing in economics. Um, psychologists have a long history of deception um, 
to try to get at the truth. So some of the more famous psychology, I mean, I think you're just trying to jab at me, but I'm going to act like it's a real question. Um, so the, so the, um, some of the more famous psychology experiments are like the Stanford prison experiment and um, the Milgram experiment. So psychology has a long history from back in the day of deception. And it was in the, um, it was, the goal of it was to try to get at really big, important questions. The Stanford prison experiment, Milgram, Milgram was trying to explain Nazis and so on. Um, that very famous experiment in the 50s where they told people, uh, they had a guy sit around and they, people said one line was shorter than another um, and it was not true because they were all Confederates except for the one guy to see if the guy would also say it was shorter. So what's the extent to which social pressure can get people? So yes, psychologists believe sometimes you lie to people to try to get at a big truth. Economists think that it's not worth it to lie because you erode the whole research process. And so possibly you're just an economist, that's all. I don't actually, anyway, so that deception in research sometimes happens. Economists don't tend to do it. I don't know about political scientists. I think it depends on the group. Yeah. Thank you so, so much. Sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs>